back in 44 BC, before this temple was as grand as it was during Hadrian's time, it was much smaller during 44 BC, a comet flew right over this very temple. This comet was a prophecy because it flew over for seven consecutive days, lighting up the sky right as a funeral procession was happening. I'm Ariel with Urbanists, and today we are going to explore the Roman Forum, the mystery of the Vestal Virgins, and the prophecies of Rome. And then we're going to explore the man who almost beat Julius Caesar. Mark Antony, not the singer, the original Mark Antony, who was Julius's second-hand man, is saying a speech right in these grounds. It was made more iconic by Shakespeare's own words, so I'll use his words. He said, friends, countrymen, and Romans, lend me your ears. I'm not here to praise the man, I'm here to bury him. But the gist was that Mark Antony returned to Rome not to praise Julius Caesar. Because if he dared to praise Julius Caesar, then he might lose his head. The Roman public liked Julius Caesar, but the Senate didn't. The Senate brutally murdered Caesar on the Ides of March 15th, 44 BC. So Mark Antony was playing it diplomatically. However, Right as Mark Antony was saying those words and this massive funeral procession for the slain Julius Caesar went on, a huge comet flew right over. According to the Roman historian Antonius, many years later, he claimed that this comet lit up the sky for seven consecutive days. To the Roman people, this was a sign that Julius Caesar was way more than just a man. He was a god, a deity on earth. Julius Caesar during his life claimed to be a descendant of Venus. Those claims were bold because Julius Caesar was a bold man. But this gave another young man by the name of Octavian, the weapon of propaganda to use in this favor. His own adopted uncle was a god because of this mysterious comet that flew right over Rome for seven consecutive days. This comet is one of the most well-known comets seen in human history because after that, Augustus claimed Julius Caesar to be a god, and he himself, who went from Octavian to Augustus, became the son of a god. Many decades later, during his reign as the first emperor of Rome, he ended up becoming a god, living incarnate. However, the flames of Rome almost went out during Julius Caesar's rise to power because that wasn't the other the only omen good or bad that the romans believed in they also believed in the fire of vesta that burned nearby let's walk over there and welcome to the roman forum now what is the roman forum well the roman forum is this area in Rome where all these governmental buildings were located. You can think of the Roman Forum similar to the civic center of New York City. That's where all the lawyers, senators, mayor, uh, many other political officials all hang out in. Clerical workers, etc, etc, etc. Every major city has its own civic center and usually they call the neighborhood after it being a civic center. So that was the Roman Forum 2,000 years ago. This is the Ark of Titus. Titus, as we know, was another major emperor. 
in later Romans history. And here we're approaching the beautiful vistas of the Roman Forum. And the Roman Forum was particularly built under two hills, the Capaline Hill, which is right there, and Palatine Hill. Now, Palatine Hill was the home of most of the palaces for, at first, the Roman senators, and then, later on, the Roman emperors. Palatine has the same root as palace. And the word palace actually comes from Palatine Hill. The word capital, as in a capital city, or in the U.S., the capital building, comes from Capitoline Hill. Our world is way more shaped than, uh, by ancient Rome than we actually even know. Now we're going to wiggle our way towards the Temple of Vesta. What is Vesta? And who were the Vestal Virgins? Because you might be exploring Rome, going to all these different sites, the Colosseum, various museums, and you might hear often the term Vestal Virgins. But people rarely ever explain what they are. Because it's very interesting. Here in Rome, there's a very fascinating relationship with the Virgin Mary. And I think this fascinating relationship with the Virgin Mary, where there's countless Santa Maria's churches all around the city, I think traces all the way back to the Vestal Virgins. But for that, we have to go all the way back to the kings of Rome. Before the emperors, before the Republic, there were kings that ruled Rome. The first king that ever started the Temple of Vesta was King Numa. This was about 6th century BC, so way, way, way back. Almost 600 years before the age of Caesar. So here we're approaching the Temple of Vesta. Let's see. And here is the Atrium of Vesta, the House of Vesta. So who lived here? Who started the Vestal Virgins? Well, King Numa worshipped a god called, a goddess called Vesta. And Vesta was depicted as a flame. And as long as that flame was lit up, it would mean that Rome would continue to thrive. But if the flame went out, Rome would disappear, crushed by its enemies. So Numa wanted to have the gods in his favor. So he built the very first temple of Vesta and hired two Vestal virgins. These were women that were made into Vestal virgins between the, six, the ages of 6 and 10 years old, and they had to serve for 30 years. Within those 30 years, they had to be uh, chaste, so they couldn't have any sexual relationships with anyone, nor could they marry either. Any type of romantic relationship was outlawed for these women. These women also had to tend to the fire of Vesta. So for 30 years, they had to make sure this flame was lit up. Because if the flame went out, Rome could die and forever disappear. By Caesar's time, the Vestal Virgins increased to six. And that was the number they had. The very maximum number they had ever. Six Vestal Virgins at any given time. Six women that were had to be chased for 30 years, maintaining the fire. They also had various other duties. They would uh, take care of wills and also make what was called the holy flower. It was flower used for virtual sacrifices done by the Roman Senate and then later the Roman emperors. However, the Vestal Virgins became a very big deal during the time of Augustus because Augustus wanted to reunite these classic Roman traditions. Augustus saw himself as kind of a, a bringer of old Rome. 
So you can kind of think of Augustus as the current U.S. president or the current uh, prime ministers that are popping up all around Europe. They promise a lot of bringing back the good values of the old country. And that was Augustus. So he brought a lot of these old practices back, including the Vestal Virgins. And this is the Temple of Vesta. Now, the Temple of Vesta was nearly completely destroyed by the 1500s because they quarried a lot of the columns and used them for various buildings around Rome. But by 1933, Benito Mussolini recovered those pieces and rebuilt the remnants of the Temple of Vesta. But what used to be a Temple of Vesta? It was a round building would actually uh, have a flame right in the middle, similar to the eternal flame that we saw underneath the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, France, or the eternal flame we saw in front of the Victor Emmanuel monument. However, this flame was way more important because unlike the eternal flame underneath the Arc de Triomphe that uh, a man unfortunately pissed over it and put a caput, that that is no issue you know it's it's a it's a disgrace but it's not that big of a deal here it is because if a vestal virgin who was tasked with maintaining the flame that day let the flame go out she might face severe punishment so first off vestal virgins had to be virgins. They were fully dressed in white, usually wearing a veil. When they would go to the Colosseum, they would have special seating, and people always wanted to get a glimpse of who were the Vestal Virgins. They were higher between the ages of 6 and 10, because it was believed that once you hit the age of 6, you most likely would live a long life, which pretty much was the case in all antiquity, because infant mortality was mortality rate was very low you had way more chances of dying when you were uh, infant but after you passed the age of six you probably lived on for much longer also the vestal virgins had to avoid any romantic relationships if they were caught in a romantic relationship the man who did something to the vestal virgin would be beaten to death barefisted However, with the Vestal Virgin, they couldn't be touched. They couldn't bleed whatsoever. So you couldn't draw blood from a Vestal Virgin. Otherwise, you would also be breaking the rules of the gods. So what would happen if a Vestal Virgin was caught having an affair? Well, one particular Vestal Virgin, under her watch, the flame went away. This made the Roman Re Republic panic because they thought to themselves, oh my god. Now we are in danger of being attacked and invaded. And this Vestal Virgin, as punishment, was locked into the Temple of Vesta and left starving. However, after 30 years of service, if you survived and weren't starved or burned alive, you can live a normal life and you can marry. And it was a very top honor to be married to a Vestal Virgin. However, most Vestal Virgins took their oath of chastity very seriously and, some of, and most of them actually continued to be chased for the rest of their lives. However, the flame almost went out on 52 BC. Because on 52 BC, Julius Caesar, while he was governor of Gaul, almost lost to a man who was uniting all the Gallic tribes together in defiance against this Roman invader. Now, when people come to the Roman Forum and basically in just general history, everyone talks about Julius Caesar because everyone talks about the winners. And while history is mostly written by the winners, but in this case, history was directly written by the winner because Julius Caesar, he always wrote a bunch of journals and used them as propaganda for Rome that would be read aloud as like the news of the day. And he also wrote in the third person. But a lot of people don't talk about the losers. 
However, this particular person who lost had, was this close to defeating Julius Caesar. And he highlights something terrible that Julius Caesar did. Because Julius Caesar didn't merely conquer Gaul, he killed entire villages, wiping them entirely from the earth. Let's walk the very steps of the final days of Vercingetorix, the Gallic king. Well, Vercingetorix was a long-haired, bearded, Gallic man, probably in his early 30s, who dared to rebel against the new governor of Gaul, Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar yet still wasn't dictator. However, this was his move to become dictator. He was desperate after the death of Cassius over there in, pa in Parthia. He wanted to conquer lands quickly so he can get a heads up over Pompey. Thus, Julius Caesar went to conquer Gaul. But the further up north you got, the more you realize how very populous Gaul was. Millions of people, not a few thousand, millions. So what is Julius Caesar to do when he's up there with millions of people that were never used to being part of what he used to call civilization? Because civilization was major cities, a city like Rome here, one million people living in one single place. However, there was not any major cities in ancient Gaul. They were all used to living in their own villages. They were used to having wars with outsiders, but not so organized by one single charismatic leader. Julius Caesar had a challenge on his hands because he couldn't subjugate these people quickly. There wasn't one king to defeat, nor one general to defeat. There were hundreds, thousands of generals to defeat. So Julius Caesar's main tactic was utter decimation, utter destruction of Gaul. He went into Gaul and killed everyone. This terrified the Gallic tribes because here was a man who had zero mercy. Here was a man who was completely destroying the Celtic people, erasing them from the earth because for him it was much easier to do that than to try to subjugate them. They were too numerous and too sparse in the land. The Gallic tribes had to fight back. And thus came a man called Vercingetorix. Vercingetorix was a charismatic leader, again in his early 30s, who decided to start uniting the various Gallic tribes under one banner. Because Julius Caesar just named himself governor of Gaul after killing millions of Celtic people. The Celts had to do something to fight back. And Vercingetorix offered a solution. Not to attack the Romans directly, but to attack their camps, to attack their supply lines, to attack any tribe that allied with the Romans. And slowly but surely, Vercingetorix conquered each and every single supply line. However, Julius Caesar had none of it. He left Rome, went back to Gaul to take care of this revolution. And thus, the Celts, the, Celt the Gallics, led by Vercingetorix, had the high ground in the hill of Alesia which is modern day Alesia. And he went up to Alesia and they had the high ground. So by all means in ancient battle, if you had the high ground, you were going to win. Especially if it's your own territory filled with a bunch of mountains and forests. What did Julius Caesar do? Well, Vercingetorix was on this hill and he was feeling pretty sure of himself. He already debilitated most of the Roman army. If he won this very battle of Alesia, he would reign victorious. Julius Caesar would be dead and the course of history would have been changed forever because Pompey was already weakened by that point. Another civil war would have happened and Rome would not have been as strong as it is now. 
or end up being. Julius Caesar went up to the hill. However, instead of attacking the hill directly on, because otherwise that would have been a suicide mission, Julius Caesar had a very notorious plan. That plan was to build a wall around the hill. Now this was unprecedented, because while most armies build a wall to protect themselves, Julius Caesar built a wall to trap them in. So you could just imagine Lalicia being Palatine Hill right over here and a wall being built around Palatine Hill. You would think that if you're on top of the hill, you have it good because you can see the entire land. But no, the wall is stopping you from coming out and getting supply of food and water. Caesar trapped them in. But then Caesar encroached beyond the wall and built another wall, an inner barrier. Vercingetorix had two walls to contend with. And then Caesar started laying siege upon Alicia Hill in France. For five whole months, the Vercingetorix and his army were left starving and dying. Vercingetorix decided to surrender. He came this close to defeating Caesar, but Caesar is for very good reason known as one of the smartest military strategists of all history because of this very battle plan. To build a wall not to keep the enemies out, but to keep them in. That's what made Julius Caesar an inspiration for countless subsequent world leaders. Napoleon, George Washington, Benito Mussolini, Hitler. Now, all those men are not the same. They all have very much, they're all different in their own respects. But at some point, they had great control over massive armies, and they used Julius Caesar's very plans from the Battle of Elisa to win their own battles. So, what happened to Vercingetorix? Well, Vercingetorix came over here, and by 42 BC, he was walking this very pathway in chains. However, Vercingetorix did not resist. He was defeated. And who could blame him? There was millions of his own kin were slaughtered of his own people. His culture was being decimated. Earlier today, we talked about Damniato Memoriae, which is the practice by the Romans to erase everything from the history books. Every mention of that person's name, every mention of that person's image would be erased from every wall, every book, every painting, every sign. The Romans committed Damniato Memoriae on the Celts. And Vercingetorix knew that. For the rest of history, almost no one knows much about the Celts. They were a very numerous culture, millions of people all around Europe. Celts were found all the way to the deserts of China. And yet, we don't know much about them. Mostly because of Caesar's holocaust against the Celts. His utter decimation of these people that lived just north of the wall of Rome. And Vercingetorix walked right over here, made his way down, 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 up through here as people are cheering, jeering, yelling obscenities, walking up these very hills. Julius Caesar in full military regalia, wearing the crown of laurels. He was victorious. He just conquered one of the largest enemies of all of Rome. In Gaul, 90% of the people were slaughtered. And right down here at the Rostra, Vercingetorix met his final stop, having to kneel and kiss the very feet of the man who completely slaughtered his entire culture. This is where the great hero of the Celts met his end, just only a few short days later in the prison nearby, strangled to death. Not an honorable execution by no means. Vercingetorix surrendered, thinking he would be met with an honorable execution. 
killed by the sword in front of the people of Rome. But no, he was left in chains kissing the feet of the man who damned all of his people and then strangled to death in a dark cell of no one to see. So it makes me think, because the more you read about history, the more it makes sense when people have certain fates. It's rare you have a good leader that is pretty innocent to die a horrible death. We already learned about Trajan, Vespasian, Hadrian. They all died relatively peaceful. None of them committed mass atrocity. None of them saw themselves as God. Vespasian even made fun of the concept of being a God. His final words being, ah, I think I'm becoming a God. He was saying that as a joke because he knew it was a joke because he knew if he took it seriously, he too would meet the same fate as Julius Caesar. So I don't think it's a coincidence that Julius Caesar was utterly slaughtered in his own forum, killed by so many senators all around him. What he did to the Celts isn't forgivable. And even though he was deified because of this great comet that flew over the skies during his funeral procession, he laid a path for an empire that would commit far larger atrocities in its future, conquering land after land. So maybe the fire almost went out that day in 52 BC as Vercingetorix was on that hill. But nonetheless, it kept a lit, lighting up the way, just like the comet did 10 years later for the Roman Empire. I'm Ariel with Urbanus. Thank you everyone so much for watching. Ciao, amici.